verse I wanted to focus on was in verse 22 where the Bible read, abstain from all appearance of evil. Now, this is a very important verse. It's a verse that gets changed in all the modern versions. The modern versions will just say, reject every kind of evil. But the King James Bible, the Word of God this morning, tells us that we should not only avoid evil, but we should even avoid the appearance of evil. We should have nothing to do with anything that looks evil. Look in this chapter, look at verse number five. He says, ye are the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So as Christians, we're the, supposed to be in the light. We're supposed to shine our light. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. And the title of my sermon this morning is dabbling in the demonic dabbling in the demonic. My question is then, if we're supposed to be in light, if we're supposed to abstain from all appearance of evil, then why are so many Christians dabbling in the demonic today? Now go if you would to 1 Kings chapter 16. 1 Kings chapter number 16 in your Bible this morning. We're going to be looking at a lot of Bible this morning. And I have a lot of examples of well, what happens when you start dabbling in the demonic. What are some of the consequences? What are some of the side effects when you decide, well, I'm just going to go ahead and start playing around with it? You say, what does dabble mean? Well, if you look in the dictionary, it says to immerse partially in water. To, so it, one of the examples would be they dabbled their feet in the pool. So you just kind of dip your feet in the pool. You're just kind of trying it out. You don't really want to jump in head first yet. You don't want to do a cannonball into the water. You're just kind of testing the waters. You're just kind of seeing how hot or how cold it is. Or it could not only be in that way, but it could be in just an activity. It says, take part in an activity in a casual or superficial way. So other synonyms would be toy with, dip into, flirt with, tinker with, trifle with, play with. So a lot of ways people are dabbling, playing with, just getting a little bit enticed, just kind of seeing what it's like, just feeling it out, just getting a little sample, getting a little taste of the demonic. Well, let's learn about a woman because she didn't just dabble in it. This woman went headlong first. But she brought her husband with her. Her husband's the one that started dabbling in this stuff. And let's see where it ends. Look at 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 30. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, above all that were before him. And it came to pass, as it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal, and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. So you see Ahab, he's a king of Israel, and the Bible says he was the most wicked king up to that point. There was no king that ended up doing more wicked stuff than Ahab. And you say, what was one of the worst sins he did? Well, he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal. Now, Jezebel, she's one that's compelling him to serve Baal, to literally serve a false god, to go out and worship devils, to worship demons. He's like, well, I'll just dabble in that. I'll go ahead and marry a woman who's given to idolatry, a woman who's given to the demonic. Well, skip down. Go to chapter 18 now. Go to chapter 18. What does this woman Jezebel do? What is this woman Jezebel like? Well, she's easily one of the most wicked characters in your Bible this morning. She's one of the worst people, especially when it comes to women in the Bible. I mean, this woman is pretty much the epitome of the worst woman that we have as an example in the Bible. Look at 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 4. For it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them by 50 in a cave and fed them with bread and water. So the kings of Israel, they have prophets of the Lord at this time. But whenever he decides to marry this wicked woman, marry this woman given to a false religion, well, now she decides, you know what? We don't need these prophets of the Lord. Let's put them to death. Let's kill all the men of God. Let's get rid of them. We don't need anybody worshiping God anymore. Let's just bring in Baal more. So he just starts dabbling with this woman. And then all of a sudden what happens? She starts killing all of God's men. She starts putting to death. Obadiah, in fear of this, had to hide some of the prophets just so they wouldn't all die. Go to verse 17 now. Skip down. It says, And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, 
But thou and thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel into Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal 450, and the prophets of the groves 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So not only did Ahab marry this woman, not only is this woman bringing her religion into the nation, not only is she destroying God's religion, but now Ahab's worshiping Baal. I mean, the Bible's saying, hey, Ahab's the one that's forsaken the commandments of the Lord. Now he's following Baal. And look at how many false prophets they're surrounding themselves with. They've got 850 false prophets eating with them day and night. And look, that evil is going to corrupt you. That evil is going to do all kinds of damage and wickedness to you when you're surrounding yourself. And notice they're also called the prophets of the groves. When you study your Bible, groves is always associated with that which is demonic, the occult, darkness, evil. You say, why? Well, a grove is where they can go hide. They go into the shade of the trees. They go into the groves at night. They go where they can do all their stuff in secret and darkness where it's not any light where there's not any day, they don't want their deeds to be known of men. They don't want people to know what they're doing in secret. That's what the demonic is like. The demonic wants to go where there's no light, where there's no doors, where there's no windows, and they want to get you locked up in the darkness and do all kinds of wicked things. Now, we don't have to dive into what all those wicked things are. The Bible says it's a shame to speak of those things which are done of them in secret, but you better know when someone's going in secret to do something, it's almost always demonic. It's almost always wicked. The only thing I can think of is when the Bible says go in your closet by yourself and pray. I mean, that would be, you know, something godly. But we see these wicked groves. This is where these prophets abound. These are where these prophets love to go. It's with the occult. That's why, you know, if you drive down the street, you'll see these Freemason buildings. You know, you, they say it's like triangle or whatever. They have the eye and they call themselves Masons or they have like the compass upside down. It has all these s- symbols. If you ever notice a Freemason building, they never have windows. Never. Every single time you drive by one of these, these buildings, they're always just either they're boarded up or the windows just don't exist. Now, what kind of buildings don't have windows today? Ones that like to worship Satan. Ones that like to do things in secret and the occult. And they don't want you to know what's going on in those buildings. Otherwise, they would be exposed for all their wicked filth, their satanic rituals, their, them worshiping the devil. You better abstain from the appearance of that evil. You better not be a Freemason this morning. Now, I'm not going into all the depths of that. Let's go to chapter 21. Chapter 21. One. So we see they're surrounding themselves with the darkness. They're surrounding themselves with the prophets of the grove. They're surrounding themselves with those that worship Baal. They've gotten rid of God. They've gotten rid of the Lord. So Ahab, he just starts dabbling with it. Oh, I'll get married to a woman like that. Now what's happening? Now he's going into somewhere he didn't even know he was going to go. Somewhere he doesn't want to go. His wife is compelling him. Look at verse 11. And the men of his city even the elders and the nobles who were the inhabitants in his city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them, and as it is written in the letters which she had sent unto them. They proclaimed a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. And there came in two men, children of Belial, and sat before him, and the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. So we see, what in, what's the end of sin? What's the end of the occult? Death. And we see what happens in this story. Well, Ahab, he wants this vineyard. He goes to Naboth. He asks to buy the vineyard. Naboth says, well, it's against the commandments of the Lord for me to sell my land unto you. He says, I'm not going to sell it unto you. That's not what God wants me to do. And Ahab goes home sorrowful. He's kind of this wimpy, you know, beta male. And he just shows up at home. and He's crying to his wife. He's like, oh, I can't, I can't have this vineyard. Oh. And what is her first response? Kill him. Why don't we just kill him and take it? How is that the first response? When you start dealing with these demonic, wicked people, they love to kill. They love death. And look, at a moment's notice, hey, I can just, I can have him killed. I got some friends. Who are her friends? The children of Belial. And you know what these type of people are like? When you start messing around with some of the demonic people, guess what? Their friends are the sons of Satan. 
They're the most wicked, vile people. They'll just lie at a moment's notice to put someone to death. And that's what the children of Belial are really like. And we see when, when Ahab decides to dabble with this woman, now all of a sudden she's killing people for him. That's why it's important you know who you marry. That's why it's important that you marry a Christian, marry a godly person. Do you want your wife or your husband to start dragging you in as an accomplice to murder? An accomplice to literally putting people to death? That's why you need to avoid these type of people. Let's go to chapter 21. Look at verse 25 now. Skip down just a few verses. Look at verse 25. But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. And he did very abominably in following idols, according to all things as did the Amorites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. So look, he's, and the Bible even says when God's judging Ahab, he says, because of the blood of Naboth, I'm going to kill you and your whole family. None of your descendants are going to survive because you decided to do this. So you know what the result of dabbling in the demonic is? Death. Death is one of the consequences when you decide, I'm just going to dabble in the demonic. Guess what? You're going to be surrounded with death. These people love death. The devil loves death. If you really want to die, if you want loved ones to die, if you want to be accomplice to murder, hey, start dabbling in the demonic. It'll take you places you didn't want to go. It'll take you where you didn't even think you were going. And there's a lot of people that die today because of this wicked, demonic filth. Now go, if you would, to uh, 2 Kings chapter 9. 2 Kings chapter number 9. You say, well, I think you're just being exaggerative. I don't, I don't think that you know, you know what's going on. You're just making stuff up. This is just an old-time Bible story. Then how come there was two junior high girls caught this week in a bathroom and they literally had knives, pizza cutters, sharp instruments and tools and they were waiting for other children to come into the bathroom so they could literally kill them, drink their blood and then commit suicide to worship Satan. There was two junior high girls. They had the plans. They had they'd written it all out. They had the instruments. They were there. They said they were going to wait for some child to come in that was smaller and younger than them so they could overpower them. And once they had gotten to 15, they were going to end their own lives. Well, luckily, a student kind of found out about it, told a teacher, a teacher told the admin, the admin called the cops, the cops showed up, and they arrested the girls. But look, this is the type of things that you subject your children to when you take them to the public full system. When you let them go dabble around with the demonic, when you let them be around these children of Belial. And look, yes, there's children of Belial today. Yes, they can be in the junior high. Yes, they can be in the high school. Yes, they can be on the college campus. And you better have nothing to do with these type of people. These type of people that will literally do all kinds of wicked filth. Look, just open your Bible. Read the first story of the Bible. What? Cain kills Abel. Look, the righteous people are constantly being, uh, you know, killed by ungodly, wicked people. We need to protect ourselves. We need to be children of the light. But when you start going around in the grove, when you start going out and hanging out with those that are worshiping Baal, you're going to get hurt. And you know what? A lot of times the result is death. I'm telling you this because I want to warn you, because I don't want you to go down that dark road. Look at 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 22. And it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace? So long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. So we see, not only is she worshiping Baal, she's literally doing witchcraft. She's a witch. She's practicing in the occult and that which is demonic and spells or whatever is going on. We don't need to know all the, the depths of Satan this morning, but we know that she's involved in a lot of wickedness, isn't she? She's involved in that which is demonic and that which is the occultist. And you know what? There's a judgment that's coming on Jezebel. You say, well, Jezebel's fine. I mean, she's the one killing and, you know, getting away with it. Well, let's go to verse number 30. And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face and tired her head and looked out a window. Well, there's your, there's your mention of uh, makeup in the Bible, women. You say, hey, I want to know what the Bible says about makeup. There's your one reference, Jezebel. Jezebel who paints her face. What a, what a great reference that is. Look at verse 31. And as Je Jehu entered into the gate, she said, Had Zimri peace who slew his master? And he lifted up his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs. And he said, throw her down. 
So they threw her down, and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses, and he trod her underfoot. And when he was come in, he did eat and drink, and said, Go see now this cursed woman, and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. And they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than a skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. So God had already cursed Jezebel. God had already prophesied that she would not be found when they were going to bury her. They were going to find her body. They only found her skull, her hands, and her feet. This is like your modern day, you know, discovery of dinosaurs. They find like one, one bone, you know, that's like supposedly their femur, and they'll tell you what their nose look like. <laughs> You're like, what? <laughs> you know, this is the, the modern day archaeology. But go to 1 Samuel chapter 15. So we see what's the end of her? It's death. Those that want to play around in the demonic, you could just get killed by Satan. You could get killed by a demon. You could get killed by the children of Belial. But you know what? God could kill you too. God could pronounce his judgment on you for deciding, I just want to mess around with this junk. I want to mess around with demons and devils and the witchcraft and all these spells and worshiping Baal and idols. Look, this is demonic. This is wicked. Christians should have nothing to do with it, let alone have the appearance of it either. We shouldn't even be anywhere close to it. Not even, oh, it kind of looks like it. And look at 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as the iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he also hath rejected thee from being king. Now this was pronounced upon Saul because he was doing, you know, the, the sin of witchcraft. And we'll get to that story later. But what I want to notice is the fact that witchcraft is tied to rebellion. And if you know the word Jezebel, Jezebel is synonymous for what? Rebellion. That's, that's not a name that people like to name their daughter this morning. Now, some people have that name, but it's always associated with that which is morally unrestrained. A woman that's given to rebellion, that is not godly, that does not love the Lord. She's always wanting to go against whatever she's you know, being subject to whether it's you know, her parents' authority, whether that's the authority of the, of the world, of the state, whether that's the authority of God's word, she doesn't want to do it. She wants to go her own way. She wants to do her own thing. The form of you know, feminism comes from this Jezebel. And you know what? This is why people dabble in the demonic. They've got a Jezebel spirit. They've got the spirit of rebellion upon them, and they want to just go against the commandments of God. They just want to go against the commandments of the Lord because the commandments of the Lord are clear this morning. There's not any shady area. It's not a questionable doctrine. It's not something there's a little bit of scripture on. Look, we're going to look at all kinds of scripture. So the person that decides to dabble in this, they've got a little bit too much Jezebel in their heart. They've got a little bit too much rebellion in their heart. And when you start worshiping the devil, you're going to be surrounded with death. So go to 2 Chronicles chapter 33. You want to dabble in the demonic? Well, prepare to be surrounded with death. Death is not something that I want. That's not something I want my family to be involved with. Let's learn about another guy. He didn't learn any better. This guy's a king of Judah. In 2 Chronicles 33, look at verse 1, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem, but did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. For he built again the high places which Hezekiah's father had broken down, and he reared up altars for Balaam and made groves and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. Also he built altars in the house of the Lord, whereof the Lord had said, And Jerusalem shall be my name forever. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord, and he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Also he observed times and he used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with a familiar spirit and with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And he set a carved image, the idol which he had made in the house of God and of God had said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. Neither will I any more remove the foot of Israel from out of the land, which I have appointed for your fathers, so that they will take heed to do all that I have commanded them according to the whole law and the statutes and the ordinances by the hand of Moses. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err and to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. So now Manasseh, he's not just dabbling. This guy, I mean, what did he not do? 
I mean, he's, he's worshiping the host of heaven. He's observing times. He's using enchantments. He's doing witchcraft. He's dealing with familiar spirits. He's doing, the, you know, the wizards. I mean, this guy wants to try it all. He wants to dabble in every single area. And not only is he affecting himself, he causes all of Judah to also go after these same things. When you decide to dabble in the demonic, you're going to embolden others to do it as well. If you're the man of the house, you're going to embolden your wife and your children to do that, which is demonic. You're going to influence your friends, your neighbors, your other family members, your extended family, your cousins, your uncles, your aunts, your grandparents, your, your grandchildren, your nieces, your nephews. There's so many people that when you decide, hey, I'm going to go out and seek this wicked stuff, I'm going to start dabbling in the demonic, you're going to have a bad influence on other people. And Manasseh, the sins of Manasseh are so great that even then they have righteous kings in the future, God's like, well, I'll delay judgment, but there's no way judgment is not coming because of the sins of Manasseh. He actually literally was offering his children in sacrifice to Molech by the fire. That's abortion. He's taking his babies and he's killing them to false gods. And you know what? A lot of these abortion doctors, they like to hang out in the groves. They like to worship Satan. They like to do that which is demonic and evil and wicked because only those type of people can murder a live baby, can rip apart a live baby. They're wicked as hell. You should, if you have a friend that's an abortion doctor, don't hang out with that friend. He shouldn't be your friend. You shouldn't be hanging out with these type of people, these wicked, evil, ungodly type of wicked filth. Now go to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Say, yeah, but Manasseh, he, he was dealing with the good wizards. You don't get it, Pastor Shelley. He, he, was, going, he was hanging out with the, you know, the white you know, wizards, the ones that are the good ones and the clean ones and the nice ones. They're, they're out for the, the good of the people. You know, they're helping people. They're like a superhero, you know, these superhero wizards and witches. And that's so popular today. There's so much, you know, movies and television and all this kind of stuff. And they try to paint this idea that there's these good witches and these bad witches and these good wizards. According to the Bible, it's all demonic. It's all wicked. There's no such thing as a good witch. There's no such thing as a good wizard. It's all evil. Look at Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. When thou art come to the land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. Now look, he keeps bringing up the fact that, guess what's tied to all this demonic worship? Killing children, killing babies, abortion. It's the same thing. He says, you don't want to sacrifice your child into the devil? Well, guess what? Don't be involved in all this demonic occultic filth. Look at the next phrase. Or useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Look at verse 13. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations which thou shalt possess hearken unto observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. You say, so I'm not supposed to hang out with that stuff? No, you're supposed to be perfect. You're supposed to be perfect with the Lord. You're supposed to strive for perfection. You're supposed to abstain from all appearance of evil. Don't hang out with this. And when we read these lists, it's like the exact same list as Manasseh, except for instead of saying not to do it, it's saying Manasseh did all of it. He's like, hey, I, I use this list as my checklist for all the things I was going to try. You know, I was going to try necromancy and the diviners, the observer of times. He did all of it, and he said he did it worse than the heathen that God had cast out before them. Now, all the inhabitants of the land of Canaan, the you know, Canaanites and the Jebusites and all these type of people, God said that they were so wicked, they had committed so much abomination in the sight of God, that when the Israelites would come to the land, they were supposed to completely eradicate all the inhabitants of the land. Not a woman, not a child left, just all of them eradicated. That was what God thought of them. That was what God's punishment was for them. And now we see the kings of Judah, Manasseh, he's causing the whole land to do worse than those of the heathen. So don't think, well, just in those olden times, that's when people did wicked stuff. That's when people were, you know, dealing with the occult. Today it's not like that. 
Today, people aren't dabbling in the demonic like they did back then. We're so much better. We haven't put 60 million babies to death in America. We don't deal with, you know, all this type of demonic, wicked filth. Well, we'll get there. Flip to Exodus 22. Flip back to Exodus 22. Leviticus 19 also says in verse 28, You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. The Bible says, regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. So if you hang out with a wizard, whether he's wearing white, black, pink, I don't care, you're going to be defiled with him. It's wicked. It's ungodly. God says that these people shouldn't even be allowed to live. They shouldn't even be allowed to exist. Look at Exodus 22, verse 18. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. That's what God thinks. Oh, what about the good witches? Put them to death. What about the bad witches? Put them to death. What about the, co the cool one? I don't care which one it is. Put them to death is what the Bible says. They're not supposed to be allowed to live. But then how come people, they just love that which is ungodly today? They love to get their book, the Harry Potter series, don't they? Oh, but Harry, he's a good wizard. You don't understand, Pastor Shelley. He does that which is good. Put him to death. Hey, Hermione and all of his, you know, friends and his buddies, the redheaded loser. I don't know what his name is. I can't remember. I was unfortunate. I'll, I'll confess my fault. I've actually seen some of the movies, not because I really wanted to. But look, this stuff is wicked. It's demonic. There's nothing godly about it. Some of the scenes in this movie are so filthy. I mean, they have like demon serpents and they're casting spells. It's like they're literally worshiping the devil right before your eyes. And there's, guess where they're doing it always? in some dark forest, in some dark, you know, grove. Look, it's no, nothing new. There's no new thing under the sun. It's all the same. But you know what? People love this junk. People eat it up. It's like one of the most popular books of human history. It's one of the most popular film series. People are making amusement parks of this whole series where you can go and go be part of the grove and go worship the devil or whatever. Go to Galatians chapter 5. You say, why are people so into this stuff? You know, they're into the Twilight series, werewolves and vampires and all kinds of demonic creatures. You know, the, the author of the Twilight series, Stephanie Meyer, she said that she wrote this book because she was just like woken up in the middle of the night and there's just these like voices in her head. And she's like, oh, I had this really cool story of these two people talking in my head. So I just had to start writing it down. And every time when it'd be in the nighttime, she couldn't sleep because she just had these vivid voices just coming into her head and just telling her this great story that she's writing down. Guess what? That's a familiar spirit. That's a demonic spirit. She's literally letting demons help her write her demonic books. And then shock her, the devil makes it one of the most popular films and gets all these teenagers into this junk. How about Ouija boards? People, I mean, they sell this at Walmart. You can go to Walmart or any of these stores, you can buy these Ouija boards. Now, thank God I never partook in one of these things. But I remember even being a young child, I was visiting one of my neighbor friends. I was probably like five or six. I was very young. And the friends were, you know, around my age and they had an older sibling who was like a teenager. And they were like, hey, let's just bring out the Ouija board. Let's play around with that a little bit. And at least even at that age, being saved, knowing, hey, I don't want to mess with that stuff. I don't want to mess with the devil. I don't want to mess with demons. At least I knew enough. I just left. I just ran away. I was like, I don't want to deal with this type of stuff. But how many kids today don't know any better and they go to their friend's house, they go to the neighbor's house, and they're like, hey, let's bring out the demons. Let's bring out the devils. Let's participate in that which is the cult. And they get subject to all kinds of filth today. You say, why is it happening? Well, look at Galatians 5, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So if you read your Bible, if you pray, if you're seeking God, if you're trying to do that which is godly, you're going to decide, you know what, I don't want to partake in that. But when you're not reading your Bible, when you're not going to church, when you're not being filled with the Spirit, when you're not renewing your mind, as Romans 12 tells you, you're going to be conformed to the image of this world. And look down at verse number 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, 
as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So you know what the Bible's telling you this morning? It's saying the flesh desires all of these things. The flesh desires adultery. The flesh desires fornication. The flesh desires to envy. The flesh desires to do all these strife and all these type of things. Witchcraft's on the same list. So your flesh desires that which is ungodly, desires the witchcraft. You say, well, how come I just like the Harry Potter series so much? It's because your flesh loves it, because your flesh wants to do it, because your flesh is rebellious against the commandments of God. So you say, well, how am I not going to walk in it? you got to decide I'm going to walk according to the Spirit. I'm going to actually read my Bible this morning. I'm going to read Exodus, where it tells me that the witches should be put to death. I'm going to read Leviticus and Deuteronomy, telling me not to have any you know, familiar spirits, not to deal with these necromancers. I'm going to go to church, where I hear a pastor get really mad about it, you know, scream and yell. And I'm going to sing songs about how I'm supposed to serve Jesus Christ, and how I love Jesus Christ. And then I'm going to be around like-minded believers that try to encourage me and exhort me to go to church, read my Bible, and not do that which is demonic. That's how you're going to avoid it. But if you get out of church and you don't read your Bible and you don't do anything godly, guess what? You'll just end up down at the grove with everybody else worshiping the devil, worshiping the Satan, going into the movie house, reading the books, getting the, the disc on tape, and eventually your wife will kill somebody. No, I don't just, <laughs> that's if you get really far in there. We go to 2 Kings chapter 23. 2 Kings chapter 23. We'll see what God judges for Manasseh. What, is, what does God think about this? Because we saw that Manasseh, he did all these wicked things. Well, maybe God liked some of it. Maybe God thought it was okay. You know, what does God really think about these type of things? Well, look at 2 Kings 23, verse 4. This is the king that comes after Manasseh. This is King Josiah. Look at verse 4. And the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest and the priests of the second order and the keepers of the door to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal and for the grove and for all the hosts of heaven. And he burned them without Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron and carry the ashes of them unto Bethel. And he put down the idolatrous priests. That's your Catholics today. That's your Catholic priests there. He put down the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah. And in the places round about Jerusalem, them also he burned incense unto Baal, to the sun and to the moon and to the planets and to all the host of heaven. And he brought out the grove from the house of the Lord without Jerusalem under the brook Kidron and burned it. In the book, at the book Kidron, and stamped it small to powder, and cast the powder thereof upon the graves of the children of the people. And he brake down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord, where the woman wove hangings for the grove. And he brought all the priests out of the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had burnt incense from Geba to Beersheba to break down the high places of the gates that were in the entering in of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were on the man's left hand at the gate of the city. So what happens? Well, Josiah decides I'm going to get rid of all of this filth, all of the groves, all of the statues, all of the idolatry. I'm going to even put all their priests to death. That's what should really be happening. Putting all these wicked, idolatrous priests like the Catholics to death. But not only that, look who's also hanging out in the grove. The houses of the Sodomites. You start de- you know, dealing with these demonic spirits, guess what? The sons of Belial are going to be there today. The Sodomites are going to be there today. Why? Because they're ungodly. They hate God. They don't want to have anything to do with God. And they love death. They're filled with all unrighteousness and wickedness and filth. And look... Guess what God thinks? Break down their house. Get everything that has to do with them. Just burn it. Just get rid of it. That's what we read in Sodom and Gomorrah, right? I mean, he just literally burns it and toasts it and says, no one's going to live here again because it's too wicked. It's too diseased. It's too filthy. It's too disgusting. It's too wicked. So if God thinks all this is so wicked, I mean, I have plenty more Bibles so far, but I mean, at this point, I mean, I feel like I've made a pretty compelling case. So here's my question. If it's so wicked, if God thinks all this is so wicked, then why are so many people celebrating on Wednesday Halloween? Why are so many people today going to glorify that which is ungodly and wicked and evil and death and demons and ghosts and skeletons and everything that has nothing to do with God? Witches and wizards and warlocks. I mean, are you reading your Bible? Are you looking at any of the stories in the Bible today? I mean, we literally have a festival where people are going to go out and dress up like a witch, dress up like a wizard, and go out and do that which is demonic. 
And you say, well, they're not really, you know, casting spells, whatever. I thought we were supposed to abstain from the appearance of evil, too. I thought we were supposed to abstain from anything that looks ungodly. And if you're going to argue with me today that Halloween doesn't even look ungodly, I mean, you need to just wake up. You need to get a reality pill today. This stuff is just literally in your face wicked. It's in your face demonic. They're praising that which is so ungodly. Now, I'll give you some information about Halloween, okay? It's called All Hallows' Eve or All Saints' Eve. So there's some different, you know, names that's been called throughout the years. It's dedicated to remembering the dead. It's all about death. It's all about worshiping people that died. Now, here's the thing. The devil is not going to tempt you with that which you would not be tempted with. He's not going to present to you spiritual vegetables to be tempted with, okay? He's not going to bring the broccoli and the cauliflower and be like, come on, I know you want it. No, he brings the Twinkies. No, he brings the Taco Bell. No, he brings the McDonald's. Now look, when I eat Taco Bell, it tastes good, but I always regret it immediately after. And that's how it is with sin. That's how it is with this wicked filth. It might feel kind of good in the flesh in the moment, but afterwards you'll regret it because it's wicked. It's evil. How many people, as a child, as you know, a teenager, you watch that horror movie and you kind of thought you liked it, but then afterwards you're like, man, I wish I didn't watch that movie. Now I can't sleep. Now I've got nightmares. Now I feel horrible. Now I feel so ungodly. Look, this is what sin will do to you. So, of course, what does the devil do? He tries to package it up and present it. Well, it's, it's cool. It's the good witch. It's the good wizard. You know? So they say, hey, we're remembering the dead. That's including even saints. Oh, so, so it's good then. We're worshiping those that were godly in the past. And we're, we're just honoring those that, that were the dead. He's trying to make it seem like it's cool. Now go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation, or I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 2. We'll look at verse 20. We'll look at Revelation chapter 2. Now also on Halloween, there's been the activity of trick-or-treating. So it's also called guising. It's where people, you know, other things that people do on Halloween, they, they wear costume parties, they do uh, carving pumpkins, they light bonfires, apple bobbing, divination games, playing pranks, visiting haunted attractions, telling scary stories, watching horror films. It says, on All Hallows' Eve, many people go to church services and light candles on the graves of the dead. So they say, this is really, really a lot of Catholic influence, but they'll go to a graveyard at night. Already sounds like the grove, doesn't it? Not being in the day, not being in the light. And they'll light candles on these graves. Well, you know what also is on these graves? You know, graven statues, images of these saints. So they're literally like paying homage to these graven images. They're going at night into a graveyard and lighting. This is how they celebrate Halloween. Sounds great to me. It says, Christians historically abstain from meat on All Hallows' Eve, a tradition reflected in the eating of certain vegetable foods on this vigil day, including apples, potato pancakes, and soul cakes. So they also have a tradition where they have these things called soul cakes. And they'd put like a cross on it, and it's like represent, you know, somebody or something. And then you'd eat them. And kids would go around, and they would like eat these soul cakes. I'll give you some more information. It's called souling. Souling, not soul winning. Souling, okay? The custom of baking and sharing soul cakes for all Christian souls has been suggested as the origin of trick-or-treating. The custom dates back at least as far as the 15th century and was found in parts of England, Flanders, Germany, and Austria. Groups of poor people, often children, would go door-to-door -door during All Hallow Tide, collecting soul cakes in exchange for praying for the dead. So they basically have a soul cake representing this person that they want prayer for, and you'd come to the door and you'd take their cake and in exchange for the cake, you'd be praying for this dead person, this person honored by this cake, souling. Okay. It says, especially the souls of the giver's friends and relatives, soul cakes would also be offered for souls themselves to eat, and, or the soulers would act as the representatives. It says, that's the tradition of hot cross buns. <laughs> you, you know that song, hot cross buns? I don't know how to go. Hot cross buns. That was literally because they put a cross on these cakes, and they'd be hot when you come to the door and you'd eat them. That's where that child's game comes from, this demonic worship of dead people. Not only that, it says um, they had a custom of wearing costumes. It was traditionally believed that the souls of the departed wandered the earth until All Saints' Day and All Hallows' Eve provided one last chance for the dead to gain vengeance on their enemies before moving to the next world. In order to avoid being recognized by any soul that might be seeking such vengeance, People would don masks or costume to disguise their identities. 
So what is he saying? He's saying basically people would dress up and disguise themselves so that nobody would, you know, recognize them or whatever, and they would go out. Now, you say, why is it trick or treat? Well, here's the thing. If someone knocked on your door and you open your door and everybody's wearing a disguise, okay, and they say trick or treat, it could be a child wanting to receive your hot cake to pray for the dead. But if it was a demonic spirit that was still wandering the earth of some one of your enemies, he could be there to play a trick on you, to do harm unto you, to get recompense. So you don't know. So it's trick or treat. Oh, what a great way to worship. What a great thing to go let your children do, to go be partaking in of the demonic, of the occult, of witches and warlocks and demons and demon spirits. Look, these spirits don't exist in that way. When you die, you either go to heaven or you go to hell. And those in hell are not coming back to wander the earth. Those are the fallen angels. Those are the ministers of Satan. Those are devils and demons. They're the ones that are playing tricks on you, you know, deceiving you. But look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 20. This is interesting. Now, withstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, here's the thing. There's that Jezebel spirit again, huh? And guess what people like to do on Halloween? They like to dress up like a whore in their little whore outfit and go to all these parties and commit all kinds of fornication. And guess what they also like to do? They like to eat these hot cakes, which are offered in sacrifice under these idols. They're literally offering them unto idols of these graven images of their friends. There's no new thing under the sun. That same Jezebel spirit in Revelation 2 is alive and well today when people like to go out and do the same things. They keep worshiping devils and demons and committing fornication and doing that which is ungodly and wicked. Any woman's costume on Halloween, it's always a whorish outfit. Every single time, take it to the bank. They all want to dress like a hoochie mama and a wicked person, and they all like to commit fornication. It's a big night of fornication in the college scene, in the high school scene. Hopefully it's you know, not so super prevalent in junior high, but you never know these days. It keeps getting worse. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. You say, well, again, you don't get it, Pastor Shelley. They're offering these things unto their loved ones. You know, even though there's a statue there, it's just that loved person. You know, it's their, it's their relative. They're not worshiping it to devils. They're not worshiping it to demons. Look at verse 19. What shall I, what say I then? That the idol is anything or that which is offered and sacrificed to idols is anything. So he says, look, I realize that this statue is literally just, you know, rock. It's just granite. It's just limestone. It's just some, you know, inanimate object. There's nothing really going on there. But he says in a physical sense. But he says, guess what? There's a spiritual sense too. Let's keep reading verse 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God, and I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. So even though in the physical realm, we understand when they have that stupid image, that stupid graven image, whether it be wood or stone or whatever of man's device, and they're worshiping it in a physical sense, it's nothing. It's just stupid. It's just pagan. But in a spiritual sense, they're literally worshiping a devil. They're literally worshiping a demon that's associated with that graven image. That's what they're doing. And they're literally eating meat sacrificed in idols. A lot of times the word meat is just used to represent food. So your soul cakes still qualifies as your meat sacrifice unto idols. Now for sake of time, I'm going to skip a few things in my sermon, but go if you would to Matthew chapter number six. Matthew chapter number six. So what about hallow? Hallow means to consecrate something. It means to separate it. It means to be holy. And God, he tells us, you know, certain things that we should hallow, certain things that are hallowed. In the Old Testament law, all the instruments of God, all the sacrifices and the things that they were performing in the house of God, he was saying these things are hallowed. So someone that was not clean, someone that had not gone through all of the commandments of God was not allowed to touch them because if they were to touch them with defiled hands, they would die. God would literally kill them for touching these things because they're separate. They're holy. They're considered righteous. So they're hallowing them. They have respect unto them. But what are these people doing on Halloween? They're having respect unto the dead, unto that which is death and demonic 
and wicked. That's not what we should be hallowing. We should be hallowing things that are godly of God. I'll give you a couple examples. Don't, you don't have to turn there. From Exodus 20, it says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. There, wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So according to God, the Sabbath day was to be hallowed. They were not to perform any work on the seventh day. They were supposed to have a complete day of rest to make that day holy. Why? Because it represented salvation. It represented the fact that we enter into God's rest, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is our Sabbath that we enter into. So they were making it holy. That's a holy thing. That's a righteous thing. This, the forgiveness of sins to all people, that if you just believe in him, if you just receive his free gift, if you just put your faith in him, he gives you the free gift of eternal life. There's nothing you can do to go to hell. You've just entered into his rest, and it's rest. We rest from our works to go to heaven. We know I don't have to do anything to go to heaven, but just rest on Christ. I just rest on the fact that he died on the cross for my sins, that he was buried, and he rose again, and it's rest because I'm ceased from my works. That's why work salvation is so ridiculous. It's so stupid because they're like, well... If you're saved, you'll have the works. No, if you're saved, you'll have the rest. If you're saved, you'll realize, I don't care what I do, I'm going to heaven. But those that love God, those that want to be appreciative towards God, they will do the works, but not out of compelling, not, not, out of, not, not, out of, not, sorry, not compelling, but not because they have to, not because they're forced to, not because they're a slave to it, but rather out of appreciation, out of love, out of the fact that they want to do these things. Now look at Matthew chapter 6, verse number 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So you know what's something that should be hallowed? The name of God the Father, our Father. And you know what? He says it's supposed to be so sacred, so set apart. He says, call no man on this earth Father. No one is supposed to be called Father. What do the Catholics do today? They call all of themselves Father. It's wicked. It's ungodly. They're not hallowing the name of God today. They're hallowing the dead. They like to go out and do that which is demonic and wicked and evil. You know what we need to be doing? We need to be hallowing the name of the Father, singing praises to the Father, lifting up and giving glory and honor to the Father. Now you say, well, you've convinced me. Maybe we're doing a couple weird things, but we're not like, you know, these heathen nations. We're not you know, and all this idolatry. I mean, there's not all these people doing this kind of stuff. Well, the psychic industry, or those that are people involved in palmistry, cardomancy, mediumship, aurora readings, and astrology, according to the U.S. economy, it's a $2 billion in revenue a year business. $2 billion in the United States. There's roughly 85,000 people who work in psychic services and make about 1.5 billion in total wages a year. Oh yeah. I mean, they had 850 prophets. You don't understand, Pastor Shelley. They had 850. That's a lot. Yeah, we have 85,000 in just the psychic services. This isn't even let alone the Satanists and you know, all these other people that just do it for fun. They're not even just in it for the money. They're just doing it because they love Satan and they love death and love wickedness. And Italy, Italy has a boom time for country soothsayers, tarot card readers, and fortune tellers. It says because they have high unemployment, it says people are seeking solace from the esoteric and the occult. It says the number of faith healers and fortune tellers has risen five times since their economic crisis a decade ago. It says Italy's National Consumer Organization, it says the sector is now worth an estimated 8 billion euros a year. So Italy doesn't even have kind of the same economy as the United States. But they're saying their industry, this wicked industry, is, what, four times more than the Americans. And euros are actually more than dollars, so it's even more than that. I mean, five, six times more are people of Italy. And there's not as many people in Italy. It says a mass majority of the country's 155,000 practitioners. Wow. Think about this. America has like 300 million people, and we have 85,000 of these people. They have 155,000 practitioners. I don't know what their population is, but it's not even we're close to the United States population. I mean, they have a lot of people doing this kind of filth. It says, while most practitioners ask for money. So most of them, they're just wanting money. It says others are demanding sexual favors from some of their most vulnerable 
clients. They're literally doing all kinds of wicked, perverted things. And when you go into the grove with the sons of the Belial and with all these wicked people, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen when they lock the doors. And guess what? There's no windows. You thought that was kind of cool. Then all of a sudden when they lock the door, it's not so cool anymore. Now it's not as fun. Now it's not a cool trip. It says around 13 million Italians, about a quarter of the adult population, regularly visit astrologers, fortune tellers, tarot card readers, three million more than in 2001. Now what happened in 2001? Hmm. There was a movie that came out called Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, the first of the Harry Potter series. Is that just a surprise? Is that just a shock that these type of things come out? It gets so popular. It gets so much interest. There's so many people involved in these things. And now Italy's like wholly given over to this wicked filth. Not only that, even in America, the percentage of men in America who admit they have contacted a physician was 39% in 2012 and 31% in 2015. I'm saying almost a third of all men in the United States admit that they've contacted a psychic before. Not only that, of women, it says women 69% in 2012 and 71% in 2015. So if you're a woman, you've never contacted a, you know, a psychic in America, you're a rare. <laughs> you're, you're a rare person, apparently. And these are the ones that admit it. These are the ones that, are, you know, we don't even know how many people have really done it. 71%? Talk about a whole country given over to this wicked filth, this wicked abomination. Their industries are palmistry, cardomancy, mediumship, aurora reading, astrology, uh, lithomancy, numerology, psychometry. I mean, there's all kinds of this stuff. And you go to any major city, you drive down, you'll see the palm readers, and you'll see the tarot card readers. And I mean, you go to a literally wicked city like Vegas, this stuff abounds. You go to the New Orleans, it's everywhere. I went to Albuquerque, it seemed like we went into this one area and it was just like a demon worshiping area. It was just like tarot card reader everywhere, palmist, you know, synagogue of Satan. It was just every, I mean, all the sons of Belial were everywhere. So go to Mark chapter 7. So what are some of the consequences of doing this? Well, if you start dabbling with the demonic, death. Not only that, you can lead to much evil. So not only can you just have death, you can have much evil. We saw with Manasseh, he did much evil. He wrought much evil on, the Jude on those of Judea, of the inhabitants of Jerusalem. You see, in your life, you can bring much evil to the Lord. Every time God sees you doing this, he says, that's evil. That's wicked. I don't like it. It's ungodly. You're not supposed to hang out with those type of things. You're not supposed to be doing these type of things. And when you start dabbling with it, God's saying, you're getting a lot of wicked stuff, buddy. You're getting a lot of evil. You're performing much evil. Now, if you're unsaved, we're going to compare two things. If you're unsaved, there's a big consequence to this. And if you're saved, there's a different kind of consequence. If you're unsaved today and you start dabbling in the demonic, you can become demon possessed. You can be literally controlled by demonic forces. Look at Mark chapter 7, verse 26. And the woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation. And she brought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it into the dogs. And she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord. Yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And he said unto her, For this, thy, for this saying, go thy way, the devil is gone out of thy daughter. Look, if you don't want your children to be literally possessed with demons, you better stay as far away from this junk as possible. And parents who have children who are not saved, and they, even if they were saved, and they just let their kids play with these Ouija boards, let their kids watch all this demonic filth on the TV and the movies, and they get to the Harry Potter book, and they start trying to perform the spells in these books. Look, it happens all the time. That's why kids get involved in all this junk and all this filth and all these spells and all this witchcraft and all these demonic sayings. They could literally be inhabited by a demon. And this woman... She doesn't like it. She doesn't like that her daughter is literally possessed by a demon. People that are possessed by a demon, what do they do? They cut themselves. They hang out at the graveyard. They get the dark hair. They get the emo hair. They like to listen to satanic music. They like to just say weird things. They're not controlled. They throw themselves in the fire. They're always very suicidal. And if you went to public school, I went to public school, there's these people going around in your school. They're dressed in all black. 
They hate everything that's godly. They love darkness. They love to live, listen to wicked music. They love to cut themselves. These people are most likely possessed. These people are most likely possessed with devils and with demons. They like to hang out in the tombs. Go to Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter number 8. Like those two girls that were hiding in that bathroom. Oh, I want my, my daughters to hang out with them, be friends with them. And look, if you, have, if you let your children bring home one of these kids, you better say never hang out with them again. I'm not against you hanging out with friends or letting your kids hang out with friends, but if they're into this occultic junk, if they're into this devil-worshiping junk, do you want your kid to be possessed with the devil? Now look, obviously if you're saved this morning, if you've actually believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're in, you have the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. You can't have a devil inside you. You can't have a demon inside you. That doesn't mean you can't still be tormented by devils. That doesn't mean you can't still be influenced by the devil. We see saved people influenced by the devil. But you couldn't be literally possessed, meaning he's controlling you. But those that are unsaved, the devil can come and literally be controlling them. They don't even know what they're doing. Look at Proverbs 8, verse 36. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. The ones that hate God, they love death. They're obsessed with death. They want to kill themselves. They want to kill people that are around them. Look, this type of culture promotes death. You say, why is there so much suicide today? Suicide is an epidemic today. Suicide is one of the leading causes of death today. Teenagers are killing them, themselves all the time. Well, they're involving themselves with demons, with demonic stuff. There's going to be all this Halloween filth on Wednesday. And guess what? People are going to be influenced to want to kill themselves because of this, to kill others because of this demonic filth. And we as a church, as God's people, should be out there shining light so that other people won't be affected by this junk, won't be affected by this demonic activity. Go to Mark chapter number five. We'll learn from another guy. Mark chapter number five. Look, the church is supposed to be a place that we come and we worship the Lord, but when we go out of this place, we should be light. And we should shine the light on the darkness, and the darkness, it runs from the light. It hates the light. It doesn't want to have anything to do with the light. But why do Christians, no, you know what Christians want to do? Let's go put on the mask too. Let's go hide our light. Let's put it under a bushel, call ourselves Mr. Bushel, and go out trick-or-treating with everybody else, and worshiping the devil, and doing that which is wicked, and ungodly, and filthy. Look at Mark 5, verse 1. And they came over under the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. There's your, you know, emo kids. They love to cry and scream. They're uncontrollable. They love to cut themselves. Skip to verse 9. And he asked him, what is thy name? And he answered, saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. This guy is not normal. This guy's not doing things in the flesh. He's literally possessed with hordes of demons. Look at verse 10. And he besought him that he, he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. So Jesus Christ comes across this guy. He's uncontrollable. He's cutting himself. He loves to hang out in the graves. This is the people that are demon possessed. Look at verse 15. And they come to Jesus and see him that he was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind and they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they begin to pray him to depart out of their coast. So what happens? Jesus heals the guy. Then the, the guy's normal again. He's in his right mind. He actually decides to put some clothes on. So this guy was, you know, naked, which all these people that love to worship the devil and get their Halloween costumes, they love to be naked. They love to be in nakedness. And look, naked, according to the Bible, does not mean that you're bare. There's a difference between bare naked and naked. Naked means you're exposing some part of your body that you're not supposed to. Naked, bare means that you literally have no clothes on. Now look, most of the people that wear these costumes, they're naked. But people don't understand that they say, well, they're not bare because they don't understand the word or the definition or the difference. And look, when you're exposing from your knee up to your thigh, any part of that part of your body, that's called nakedness, according to the Bible. I'm not going to prove it today, but you, you read your Old Testament law. That's nakedness. And sometimes women today, they'll have their buttocks hanging out of their shorts. It's disgusting. It's wicked. They're naked. You say, oh, they got shorts on. 
I don't care what they got on, that's nakedness, that's not godly. And we see this guy, he's naked. That doesn't mean he was necessarily bare, but he's exposing parts that he shouldn't. Now when he gets his right mind, when he gets some of God's word into his heart, oh, let's put some, let's put some clothes on. Let's actually dress like a person, dress like a human. So we see that what happens after this, though? Did the people rejoice? I mean, think about this. This guy literally had thousands of demons inside of him, and he just healed the guy. He just healed this guy that was uncontrollable. Nobody could control him. He's been demonically influenced. Now, all of a sudden, he's completely healed. He's healthy. He's dressed nice. I mean, he's, he's, he's in his right mind. You could talk with him. And the people should be rejoicing, right? I mean, like, yeah, praise the Lord. Praise God. Hallow his name. Guess what they do? Get out of here. We don't want you. We don't want this. They would rather have the guy demonically influenced. And guess what? If you go to the world today and you say this is demonic, Halloween's evil, Halloween's wicked, get out of here. We don't want that. We want the, de we want the devils. We want the demons. We like this guy. We like to poke fun at him and look at him and do whatever. They think it's entertaining. We like to put it on the TV, you know, and watch it, and it's really cool. Look, people do not like, you know, that which is godly because they're only in the flesh. So you know what the cure is? Get them saved. That's how you're going to cure these type of things. The people that are unsaved, the only cure is getting them saved. So why am I preaching such a hard sermon this morning? Because it's for the saved. It's not for the unsaved. If I preach this type of message to the unsaved, they'll just, they won't like it. They would have already, they would have already been gone. Everybody, everybody would have walked out. They would have been too offended. They wouldn't have liked it. Look, but you that are godly today, let's learn what God's truth is. And when you're talking to your family members, I'm not going to try and show them all the verses I showed them about how ungodly Halloween is. I'm going to first try to get them saved. Preach Christ and Him crucified. Then once they're saved, then we'll show you all the Bible. Then we'll show you all these other things. The you know, this is the opposite of street preachers. Street preachers think, well, we'll just you know, tell you all the wicked filth that's going on in the world and try and get, you know, compel you to get saved from that. They're not interested in that story. They're not interested in that message. Preach Christ and Him crucified. Now go to Leviticus chapter 19. And 1 Samuel 28. Only a couple last places. This is my last point for this morning's sermon. I'm going to look, go a few minutes extra, but this is important. What happens if you are saved, though? Okay, so we've looked at a couple things. If you, deal, if you dabble in the demonic, you can experience a lot of death. If you dabble in the demonic, you're going to do a lot of evil. If you dabble in the demonic and you're unsaved, you could be demon-possessed. You could have anybody in your family be demon-possessed when you're surrounding yourself with devils. But what if you are saved? And you, you, can't really, you can't really be possessed with the devil. What could be the result of that? Well, look at Leviticus 19, verse 31. Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord, your God. So go to 1 Samuel 28. How can you get defiled? So according to the Bible, you could be defiled in some way when you deal with these type of spirits. It also says in Leviticus 20, I'll read for you, a man also or woman that hath a familiar spirit or that is a wizard shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones, their blood shall be upon them. Now Saul is the first king of Israel and he actually implements this law. He says, if there's any witch, we got to put them to death. That's what the Bible says. That's what we're going to do. But then Saul, you know what? He doesn't have a good relationship with the Lord. He's forsaken the laws of God. He's had a lot of rebellion in his heart against the commandments of God. Now, what was rebellion? It's that Jezebel spirit. And you know where it's going to lead you? To witchcraft, to things that are more demonic, to things that are wicked. Because what? The sin of rebellion is as of witchcraft, is what the Bible says. Now, look at verse 3. Now, Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together, and they pitched in Gilboa. So what does he have? He, he, puts, he wants to put them out of the land, right? He's trying to put them to death or get them out of there or whatever. Look at verse 7. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. So what does Saul do? Well, look at verse 8. And Saul disguised himself. Sound familiar? What, what do people want to do on Wednesday? They're wanting to disguise themselves and go around and seek familiar spirits. All right, let's keep reading. And put on other raiment, and he went, and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night, and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up, whom I shall name unto thee. Verse 12. 
And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried in a loud voice, and the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw God ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God is departed from me, and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. Then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, saying, The Lord is departed from thee, and has become thine enemy? You want to dabble with the demonic? You will be rejected of the Lord. You will become an enemy of the Lord. You say, I thought I was saved. You are saved. But you know what? You can still be an enemy with him on this, in, the, in the flesh. If you decide to just go do that which is ungodly, to be of the world, you can have enmity with God. You can be an enemy of God. Now, we know Saul's saved because he's going to go be with the Lord. He's going to end up dying in this battle the next day, end up killing himself, and he's going to go be with the Lord. But while he's in the flesh right now, he's been completely rejected of God because of his rebellion, because of that Jezebel spirit in his heart. Now he's going to seek witches and warlocks and wizards. If you decide to dabble in the demonic, to be rebellious against God's word, he can say while you're still alive on this earth, I've rejected you. I don't want anything to do with you. But guess what? When you die, you'll still come to be with me. But right now, I'm just delivered you unto Satan. I'm delivered you unto the devil. Go be with the devil. Now look, if Saul had realized, hey, God's not really talking to me anymore. I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to seek the Lord. Look, our God is long-suffering and he is merciful. But we need to be careful what we're doing. Obviously because he rejected him, what does God do? Well, he ends up dying the next day. He ends up dying because the Lord's rejected him for the destruction of the flesh, literally. And if you want to die in the flesh... Go seek that which is demonic. It'll happen real quick. You'll find Jezebel and Ahab and Manasseh and all these demonic people that are literally possessed with demons. You'll go find those junior high girls in the bathroom. And guess what? They want to kill you and drink your blood and put you to death because the Bible says all they that hate me love death. They're surrounded with death and they do all kinds of wicked stuff in the groves. And you say, oh, I think Halloween's fun. It's about candy. Look, I can give my kids candy whenever I want. And look, there's nothing wrong with dressing up. I mean, it's fun. hey, dress up like a cowboy, dress up like a fireman. I, that's not what's wicked about Halloween. But it's the hallowing of the dead. It's the hallowing of that which is wicked. And we're supposed to abstain from all appearance of evil. That's why I don't have anything to do with it. That's why on Wednesday, or any time there's Halloween, our church is going to have an alternative activity. You say, what is it like? Is it like Halloween? Zero. No costumes, no dressing up. We're not doing trick-or-treating. What do the Christians like to do? Trunk or treating. Where you still dress up like a devil and a witch and a demon and come to church and do it. How's that any better? That's not any better. That's just, that's just pr pretending to be like the world. Go to 2 Corinthians 6, the last place I'll have you turn. Look, I'm never going to celebrate Halloween, and Christians should have nothing to do with this wicked holiday. That which is ungodly, it's dabbling in the demonic. And look, the Bible's so crystal clear. There's so many verses, there's so many stories, there's so many examples, there's so many consequences. Look at 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Remember where we started? You're the children of the light and of the day, not of the darkness. Keep reading, verse 15. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Remember all those sons of Belial we're reading about? They're hanging out in the groves. Why, why does Christ have anything to do with those type of people? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Hey, Catholics, what agreement does the you know, temple of God have with idols? They're a temple of idols. They're not a temple of God. For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. There's your mention for women, okay? You know, people say, oh, you become a son of God. Well, you can be a daughter of God, too. It tells you right here, you're a daughter of God when you believe on him. And look, that's what we should be. 
We should be separate. We should be holy. We should not touch the unclean thing. We should not deal with demons and devils and that which is wicked and ungodly. And you know what? I've even been in an independent, fundamental Baptist church where they have, for like Christmas, they'll have the graven images on the back table. They'll have, you know, the Mary statue and the Joseph statue and the camels and the three wise men. Look, there is no idols allowed in this church ever. You get it out of this place. This is not a place for any graven images, period. And if I see it, I'll get real angry real quick. It'll be thrown out. Amen. That is not going to be tolerated in the house of God, some wicked image. You say, well, I got them at home. Well, you, you dabble with demons, but I'm not going to. And this house of God is not going to. I don't care what it is. It's not going to be in this house. We're not going to let demon spirits come in here and influence us. The Bible says the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Death is an enemy. Death is not to be celebrated. Death is not to be hallowed. Death is not to be praised. Death is not to be celebrated by us going out and worshiping death. That's wicked. God is a God of the living, not of the dead, is what the Bible says. So if you want to worship God on Wednesday, come to church and we'll hallow the Father while everybody else goes out and hallows death because they love that which is demonic and wicked and evil. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Father, so much for all that you bless us with. Hallowed be thy name, the name of God the Father, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost. I pray that we'd want to give honor and reverence unto your name, that we would not dabble in that which is demonic and wicked and filthy. I pray that you just help us with the rebellious spirit of the flesh, that we desire to walk in the spirit by reading our Bible, by praying, by going to church, by, reading, by listening to godly music. I just pray that you continue to help everybody in this room to abstain from all appearance of evil. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.